Please join me in welcoming Terry Butts, Nancy Lindblom, and Joan Sobel. I'd like to start by asking our participant educators to react to what they just heard in the presentation and some of your questions, and maybe if they were following the Twitter hashtag in the AFCON, what are the implications of the profession of teaching given what has been laid out? What would you add? What would you refine? Any particular order? No? Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Terry Butts, as you can see, and uh, a lot was said in that 45 minutes. If, do you agree? <laughs> yes, a lot. And I was trying to jot down some notes. Um, and one of the things that I took away from it, uh, dealing with what Paul was saying, was about the delivery system and how, um, and I'm paraphrasing, how we need to make that shift from the industrial model to what we are now, which is an information model. And that has to take place in what um, Deborah was saying as far as our teacher preparation is concerned. Our teachers are teaching still the same way that we were taught. With the, we're 21st century children, but we're teaching with a 20th century model, where we're looking at children knowing facts, knowing information, being able to recall, where now we have to move toward conceptual understanding. And there's a lot of information out there. I don't need to stand in front of a classroom and disseminate information anymore pick up any device and there's your information. But now I have to teach children how to make sense out of nonsense. I have to teach children to be creative. I have to teach them to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. That can't be done when we're still trying to teach along with the industrial model where children are setting and getting. Children now have to be involved, they have to collaborate and they have to work together so that they can be uh, problem solvers. Do you want to go next? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, I had a lot running through my mind as I was listening to our speakers, and, and one, it brought back actually a conversation that I had with my niece just recently. And I had asked her why she had not enrolled in a certain class that um, she had told me that she was going to enroll in. And she said, well, I asked a lot of students around campus, and they told me, if you get this one teacher, you're gonna have an awesome experience. And if you get this other teacher, then you're not gonna really learn anything all year long. And she said, I didn't want to risk it. I didn't want to risk it. And so I chose not to actually sign up for that class. And I thought about what was said of this idea of having a highly um, skilled teacher in every single classroom. And then um, Paul's list that seemed a bit overwhelming to me as I listened. Um, but I was loving, I loved the, the first one, the idea of a nimble curator of knowledge and content experts and pedagogical practitioners and applying knowledge and personalizing and advocating and inspiring. And I thought to myself, this is so much that we are asking of our teachers, how do we become this? What does this look like? How do we have these highly skilled teachers in the classroom? And as I look back over my experience in the classroom in the 20 years that I've had, my answer is other teachers. Teachers, in my experience, are the most intelligent, the most creative, the most hardworking, and the most compassionate people that I know. And they are experts at what they do. And if we can learn from each other and collaborate and learn and grow together and witness what's going on in each other's classrooms and sit down and plan with each other and have these best practices sessions with each other, then we can become this and we can have every teacher be that highly skilled teacher that we, we need that will have an awesome experience in that class and every class on campus. <laughs> So I, um, too, was struck by Paul's list, and I was also thinking about Deborah's comments about that rigorous training that teachers need to have. In my school, I provided uh, a lot of support to teachers. Part of my job was to provide support, and that was also, that was to new teachers in particular. We had two levels of licensure in Massachusetts. People who came in with initial licenses, which meant they already had some teacher training, although very varied teacher training, and teachers who came in on preliminary licenses, which meant they were going to get teacher training through accredited programs while they were actually teaching. I can honestly say to you that the experiences of those two groups were really, really different, and the teachers working on preliminary licenses 
struggled a great deal unless, as you're saying, they happened to be partnered with somebody who really could show them a line. My, uh, my concern with what Deborah is saying about rigor is I look at my own life and I think it took me about eight years to become a really good teacher. And the first part of my teaching experience was in a very homogeneous suburban Massachusetts community. So it meant that I could really focus a lot on what it was I was doing in the classroom. And frankly, the kids were just like me. And mm -hmm. then I moved to Cambridge and suddenly there was this whole range of kids. And all I could think to myself when I first came into that job was luckily I already knew how to teach because there were all these social and cultural factors that I needed to negotiate. So as I look at even our teachers working on initial licenses who are really quite good, I keep thinking not so much of teacher training as teacher growth. And so one of my questions for Deborah would be, um, what is the What's the amount, what's the kind of guideline, that benchmark for going into a classroom and not doing harm? And then what does the growth look like beyond that? And I'll stop there because I could go on and on. <laughs> You wanted to answer that question? I would love you to, if you, <laughs> <laughs> because I, Paul's list to me is so right, but it's so much. Um, I, this on? This on? Yes? Okay. Um, so the question about, I think you're asking about what the threshold would be yes. for, not, for not being, for being able to be minimally responsible. I think we don't like words like that because we have ambitions for really, glorious and imaginative and highly skilled teaching, and we talk about that a lot, it's really important. But that would be a little bit like if we were teaching kids to read and we started with reading very complex text and um, not mm -hmm. thinking about what the stages are toward it. And we've done better in subject fields to kids to begin thinking what does it look like to be a reader early or what does it look like to be doing math when you're six or whatever it is. And I think it's a professional conversation among us to say, if that person were teaching next door, maybe if that person were teaching the previous grade in whatever school I was teaching, would I be comfortable professionally that that person were responsible independently for kids? I have my own list of things, but our lists might, we might disagree about the lists, although I'd be curious how much we disagree of what should be on that list. But for me, the question is, would we be willing to have that conversation as a profession and stand up for the idea that it shouldn't be okay to be not yet at that threshold, so I'm, I know I'm not completely answering your question. I would make a list of things that I think happen so often in a classroom that if you can't do them at some basic level, you're not gonna be able to get, you're not gonna be able to be responsible for the kids that year, and it just seems really unfair to the kids. And it's too often kids who really most depend on public schooling to be adding things that they might not otherwise encounter. It just feels very irresponsible to me. So some of them are very mundane that almost seem like they shouldn't have to be mentioned, like being able to actually build a relationship with a child that you're interacting with them and hearing what they're saying to you and not talking over them. But you know, that's basic. And you know a lot of entering candidates can't do that. They just talk the whole time. Or they assume the kids are wrong when the kids are saying things that are totally sensible. So we can make the list together. I just wish that we would be willing to do that. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you for your reflections. Um, so I have a couple of questions here, uh, a couple of prompts. Um, the first one is about college and career ready, and that's, that's one of those buzzwords that we hear a lot about. ACT has a number for us that tells us who's college and career ready. SAT has a number for us. Uh, Common Core has an, uh, there's an, all sorts of numbers. So what do you think about this conversation about college and career ready? What does that look like? like what's the meta? I don't think it applies to just SAT and ACT scores. Um, I'm currently reading The Element by, I believe his name is Sir Ken Roberts, and um, you know, he talks about multiple intelligences and how we only look at academic intelligence and how students are so ingrained now in trying to beat this particular standardized number, trying to reach a particular score on an SAT or uh, an ACT, so that they can get into a particular college but we have multiple intelligences that those particular tests don't score. 
Students are kinesthetic, they're visual. Um, they have so many other intelligences that we don't tap into when we're looking back once again at that industrial model of instruction. We're not allowing them to be critical thinkers and showing their creativity. When you put them together in, in situations where they're able to collaborate with their learning, um, it gives them an opportunity to be what they're going to be one day as workers. We don't have a society where you go to work and you sit in rows and you are learning uh, rote factual information. What do we do at work? Hopefully we collaborate. Hopefully we're thinking about solving some problems. Hopefully we're being creative in the things that we have to, uh, to do each day to engage our children. That's what it's gonna take in order for us to have our, I teach preschool. So my kids aren't gonna be <laughs> career and college ready for a number of years yet, but yet we're trying to, to start that foundation for them. When you're talking to our high school folks, maybe they can answer that a little bit better, but I see it as being one um, where we're not only looking at test scores and looking at one intelligence, but looking at those multiple intelligences. Um, I see it, if I wanna boil it down to the most simple form, I need to teach students how to think. Yeah. It's the basic um, stance that I take with my students. It's not about teaching them knowledge, it's a teaching them about what to do with that, um, how to apply it. Um, most recently in my classroom, um, in fact, just yesterday, okay, so most recently in my classroom, my students uh, um, were participating in a, a debate. Um, the debate that they were participating in was on whether secession is constitutional or not. Right? So they had sources that they looked at. Um, they had some sources on both sides of the, um, of the viewpoint. Um, they then had, were given the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. They were told to investigate further, find their own information, and then to be able to then articulate an argument over it. Mm -hmm. And as I sat and I listened to my students, they blew me away. It was amazing. I could have stood up in front of my students and could have said, here's the arguments about why secession is constitutional. Here are the arguments why secession is not constitutional. And they would have walked away and they would have memorized their list and they would have taken the test and they would have done fabulously because they're great kids and then they would have forgotten everything and they would have walked away. And I didn't teach them how to think, I just gave them some knowledge to maybe dispose of a little bit later. When I gave them all of this for them to wade through, for them to analyze, for them to be able to disseminate everything and then to be, form an opinion about it and then to be able to articulate that, they walked away from that experience really understanding, mm -hmm. having a critical thought process, analyzing it, learning how to think, not just learning knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, the language of college and career readiness, I, I have to tell you, I, I always hate that phrase because it, um, it makes me think that the principal role that we're playing is to prepare kids to be part of our economy, um, not even necessarily part of our democracy. So I was really pleased, Paul, when you broadened the definition mm -hmm. not to be just economic and you talked about democracy and you talked about people leading families and we began to get to kind of some of the moral and spiritual aspects of education and that matters a lot to me because um, I don't believe that kids come every day to school to get college and career ready. I think that's something they, it's one of the things that's on their mind. If it's the only thing that's on their mind, they're anxious all of the time. Um, but I do think that everybody comes to school to have a good day. And that's different for some kids. Some kids come to school and hope the good day is they don't get into a fight with that kid that has been giving them a hard time in the cafeteria. Other kids hope that they did the right homework assignment and they're not gonna get in trouble. Uh, some other kid just hopes, like I, I think of the really anxious kids in my AP class, that I'm not going to assign another paper because they already have 13 hours of homework between now and Thursday. So I really think that uh, there's a lot more to school than college and career ready. Um, part of what worries me a lot of the time, especially when we start talking about SATs, and I'm so glad that we, we're talking about the insufficiency of those exams and also about thinking. Uh, I think that 
kids really do want to learn. I, I went to a forum that we had in Cambridge a while ago about the achievement gap. It was actually a few years ago, and it was moderated by Ron Ferguson, um, from, also from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And he was talking about how important it is to understand that we are all hardwired to learn. And some of our work is not to betray our, high, our hardwiring and make education um, I don't know, be more of something that we do for other people or for other purposes than for ourselves. So I, I'm convinced we can do all of those things at the same time. The only other thing I want to say is when we only talk about achievement tests, I think we stop talking about the 21st century and all those soft skills that we know are so, so important. And so um, I'm excited that uh, Nancy brought up the idea of when you create a kind of context or an environment in which kids can do good thinking. And I just want to recommend to you Ron Richard's work on building cultures of thinking because there really are ways to help kids think and a lot of that is about building the academic language that allows them to express what they're thinking and talk about it with other kids. Yeah. I, I think, I think your, your comments are, are so very important because as a policy trained policy analyst, when I sit down and I look at any particular policy, often what comes to mind is the NAEP score, that particular test score. Uh, that's what people see as college or career ready, you know, mm -hmm. how many students receive certificates from the cosmetology program. But maybe we should be thinking not about this as college ready or career ready, but citizen ready. Um, <laughs> so one final question, and we only have uh, just a few minutes here, three minutes. So give me those 30 second answers. Are you ready? <laughs> so. Uh, Dr. Ball issued a challenge. Uh, she issued a challenge that was, we need to sit down and think about how to do this. Otherwise, there's other folks that are going to do it for us, right? Uh, and so the, the question that I have here that Montel Williams gave me is, how should teachers think of themselves or position themselves as advocates for the profession when engaging those outside of it? What are the implications for that shift? or those who say they're inside of it, but are really outsiders to the profession. What do you think about that? Who wants to go first? I'm, still going going first. No. I'm not going first this time. I've used all my cookies. So what can we do to be advocates? Um, I thought, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another little story, right? Um, this summer, my brother-in-law said to me, I am sick and tired of seeing all the posts on Facebook from teachers. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, they're talking about how hard their life is mm -hmm. and how they, uh, everything that they have to do, and oh my gosh, the countdown to summer, and here it comes, right? And I said, oh, that's awful, right? I mean, this is what we're putting out there. Um, as teachers. Um, then I worked with a, uh, another teacher this summer and he showed me a, a Twitter um, I don't, a campaign that they were doing in their state and it was what teachers do over the summertime. And all teachers were, um, were tweeting out pictures of them at PD. Um, they were um, tweeting out pictures of them working with students. They were tweeting out all of the positive things that we do for, for our students during our off hours in all of those times that we were there. And I thought to myself, now that's what we need to be doing. That's, we need to be positive advocates where we can put these campaigns out there to show what, we, what it is that we actually do for students in, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, on our free time, but we need to be constantly aware of the public around us and being um, able to be those positive advocates for what we do and, and how we stand up for children. And, you know, and I, I think it's incumbent upon us as faculty and institutions of higher education that we mobilize um, our knowledge too. I've been thinking about this uh, as a personal advocacy ecology, that's how I think of it, is my own ecology of, of advocacy. But what do you think the implications are of, 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 of teacher organizations, but also you individually having uh, this, new, this advocacy ecology? Are you asking me? I know I promised you no hard questions in our conversation. <laughs> but I said, he said, oh, we won't ask you anything <laughs> really hard. <laughs> but, what, but what do you think about that? I mean, essentially, what are the implications of a shift where educators are at the forefront? I mean, look at the Secretary of Education, right? 
it, are, are, we, are we putting educators at the forefront of our conversations about education policy and reform, right? Any thoughts on that? No, we're not. And I think um, educators, unfortunately, are not informed. Um, we have a new uh, system that's coming down in my state for evaluating teachers and value-added measure and all those things. I'm sure you heard those terms. And the number of teachers that didn't know what was about to happen to them personally and professionally was astounding. And we can't impact policy if we don't know policy. And oftentimes that's what's happening. People are dictating to us what needs to be done because we don't know, or we know, but we don't speak up for what should be done. We have the boots on the ground, as we were saying at our table earlier, but the folks who have no idea of what is happening in those four walls are the ones that are making policy for us. We have to be our own best advocates, but we can't do that if we don't know policy. How can a bill be passed that directly impacts you and you have no idea that it was even happening? You're not informed. We can't be our own best advocates if we don't know what's happening. Thank you. I want to add in that I don't think that every teacher is born um, as a leader either. And I think that teacher leadership is something that we need to train within our teachers. I think that we need to actually teach them to step out of their classroom, that we need to teach them to stand up for education. And that is um, something that we, um, as a profession, have not done a good job at, um, is to actually giving teachers the tools they need to be able to be that advocate um, for, for the teaching profession. Okay. Then one final oh. Oh, I just want to say, in the state of Massachusetts, where we have a very proactive um, association, I think, uh, unlike your state, Terry, we often knew about things that were coming down, and our, our leadership met with us, and uh, there was a lot of conversation, so I actually think we were treated quite professionally. Um, however, I also think that often teachers are so busy with their day-to-day -day lives and the expectations of, that parents and other people have of what they're going to be doing that they sometimes can't be as politically active as they might want to be. So uh, I don't quite know how to manage that. Um, you know, people who are teaching all day long have a lot of papers to correct and a lot of parent emails to respond to. So one final question from Dr. Rebel, and then, um, and then uh, Harriet uh, Sanford is, is going to come with uh, some gifts. All I wanted to say in response to that is, you know, I, th I think what we strive for, and I, you know, I appreciate Joan's comment, I think we've done a pretty good job of this in Massachusetts of doing reform with the field rather than to the field, mm -hmm. uh, although it hasn't been perfect in that regard. But I do think if you step back from policy over the past 20 years, much of it nationally and in most states has been done to the field rather than with the field. Mm -hmm. And the field has to take some responsibility for mm -hmm. that itself. Mm -hmm. In other words, if things are being done to you, you have to organize to respond. And this is an association in which it's all about organization. And I, but I do think that coming together and the hard conversations that allow associations of teachers who, where there are very divergent opinions to come together with one voice to speak up about matters of policy. Uh, this kind of thing is critically important. No Child Left Behind was done to the mm -hmm. field. The unions kind of, I, I would argue, sat on the side, mm -hmm. and that happened. And so now, if we want to go forward with a new vision, I believe there's an opportunity for teachers to shape that new vision. I personally happen to think it's not so much talking about the teaching profession primarily, but it's talking about what children need to be successful, which secondarily leads you to talking about what teachers need in order to be successful with children. But I think this idea of having teachers take the lead, assume the position, assume a voice in the conversation and a place at the table, argue and advocate for kids, and by way of doing that, you get to talking about teaching in the teaching profession. Thank you all.